Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept. The eyewitness accounts has recorded in the synoptic gospels and throughout the New Testament about his resurrection tells us that we have a hope, that we have a living hope, and that nothing created can somehow overcome or distract from that living hope. Welcome to Bethel Christian Assembly from Lakewood, Colorado. Today, Pastor Gary teaches on making decisions. In the second message in a three-part series, he teaches us how to make decisions that are according to God's will. Let's join in now. Um, we're preoccupied, and rightfully so, with the pandemic. It seems like there's never a day that goes by that somehow, some way, we're not reminded of it. Um, Yet, at the very same time, we have a living hope in Jesus Christ, amen? And um, our, our attitude and our thoughts in reference to the pandemic is uh, needs to show love and compassion, but at the same time, it's not where we go to the end of the plank and say, I'm ready to jump off. In life, in fact, let me just say it this way, physical life is not always fun, is it? And I'm sure that I could have each and every one of you stand and give a, a statement in reference to how life isn't fun, and that would be your history, but if, in fact, at the end of that or throughout that speech that you might give, if it included Jesus Christ, it is no longer history. It's a testimony. A testimony. Do you have a testimony for Jesus Christ in this holiday season? You see, the reason, and you've heard it so many thousands of times, and I guess if we had a dollar for each time, we'd be more wealthier. But Jesus is the reason for the season. And there is nothing that's amongst the created that somehow can distract from what the Creator has done. Whether you believe or don't believe doesn't have any internal, external force or uniqueness on that fact. God chose to create. Didn't have to, but he did. And when God does something, surely he has to do it to the very best of his ability. Amen? There is no second class with God. So that means we're all first class. Amen? We were created, and when God finished creating you as me as human beings, he said it's not only good, but it's very good. I'm in the group of the very good. And if you get rid of God, then I'm that species, the only species that exists that has a potential of free will. And free will, as we made mention last week, can either be a blessing or a curse, can it not? Free will can, can uh, lead to the benefits or the results of being an individual making choices and decisions that are productive and constructive and certainly spiritually speaking that can allow that individual to be in a right relationship with God through his son Christ Jesus, living the power living life by the power of the Holy Spirit, which gives him the hope, my friend Travis, the hope that will not be the first to rise, but will be amongst those who rise in the first resurrection. Amen? Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept. 
The eyewitness accounts has recorded in the Synoptic Gospels and throughout the New Testament about his resurrection tells us that we have a hope, that we have a living hope, and that nothing created can somehow overcome or distract from that living hope. No matter what you think, no matter what you do, cannot somehow take away from me my choice to use free will to believe in that living hope. I have decided to follow Jesus. Get over it. Amen? Get over it. Now, if you want to follow something else, that's your choice. I may not like it, but I'm not going to stop you from I'm not going to try to abduct you. I will challenge you in reference to your illogical, irrational reason for doing so, but I won't do it in such a way that I condemn you because, unfortunately, you're already self-condemned. I'll do it in such a way in which I bring enlightenment to you and you'll discover, separate from anything that this world has to offer, the fact that you have a choice. And that choice that you may not know about is simply Jesus Christ. Amen. And so this is a time of year in which we take and reflect upon that fact. All the powers that Satan can muster and all the individuals that he certainly tries to influence and does influence cannot prove scientifically, logically, rationally that Jesus Christ didn't exist and they can't even come close to disproving his resurrection. And therefore, we know it's true. For just as you and I seek to serve God and hunger after righteousness, there are those who are equally impressed and equally um, desired to somehow serve unrighteousness. And they can't prove it. They can't prove it. Lee Strobel was a good example of that. Actually, um, to some degree, um, C.S. Lewis was as well. Um, at one particular point in time, um, oh, the reformer, Martin Luther, who penned the 95 Thesis on the Roman Catholic door, all in their worldviews were atheists. But when you intellectually, with honesty, do an intellectual research into Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, you'll have to make a decision. Just like we've made decisions this week, right? You make any decisions this week? I certainly have. Last week we discussed the fact that he loves me, he loves me not, and we, so, we went through that little game and it was kind of foolish, but yet it was fun. Okay. But it's very unreliable because it's not based on anything than the number of petals on the stem of a flower. In fact, we got to the point where we made the decision to look for the one that had the right outcome. As if we were all knowing. Right? And we simply said this, wise decisions are made by discerning the will of God. By understanding the will of God. Wise decisions are made by understanding, that is, discerning the will of God. We talked about the fact that a decision is intellectually known and can be practically experienced. You can make a decision in your mind and then you can fulfill it in your behavior. 
We make decisions like that every day. Some are, like I said last week, very insignificant, and a but, it's a big but too. Some will change your lives forever. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 40, verse eight, I desire to do your will. Oh my God, your law is written within my heart. Or your law is within my heart. See, we can have an intellectual knowledge of what to do and whether or not at that particular point in time before we even do it, whether or not it will be pleasing to God. Whether or not it will be obedient to his word and to his revelation of himself to us in time and history. But it really comes down to what you desire. Do you desire the things of this world, the created more than you desire the creator? Doesn't it always come down to that? Many times you've made a decision such as I have, knowing that we're making a wrong decision, but we go ahead and do it. Why? Because we think it will lead to the fulfillment of the desires of our heart. When many times it just brings gloom and doom. And you'd think we'd learn. You'd think we'd learn. But what's the old saying? Insanity is keeping doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, thinking that somehow the results will change. No. They don't. When you make bad decisions, you get bad results. When you make delusional decisions, you get delusional results. In fact, many times in life, bad choices, bad decisions, delusional decisions are made because we don't take time to discover God's will. To exactly know and understand what God wants us to do. But at the same point in time, there's times in our lives where we know exactly what he wants us to do, but we don't will it into existence. Our love for ourselves, as well as the love for what we think will be, the, will be the end result in reference to whatever we're making decision on is greater than our love for him. And unfortunately, sometimes those have everlasting or seems to be everlasting consequences, which uh, if we could exchange them, we would. Wouldn't it be cool if we had a decision store? You could just take your bad decisions back and return them. What's wrong with it? Oh, nothing's wrong with it. It's just, I don't need it anymore. I don't need that bad decision anymore. Do you have the receipt? No, I'll just put it on my decision card. Give me credit. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? Huh? Holy Spirit came up with that and gave it to me. Don't, I don't take any credit for that. If in fact it's a good decision and it produces the proper results, would you ever take it back? Maybe you'll borrow a decision. Well, I need this decision for just this one moment in life and then I'll take it back and get credit. <laughs> That's not a good decision in itself, is it? I will tell you this, that as you sincerely begin to place God's desires above your own, he will be faithful in and toward you. 
The decision-making process is a process that includes making a choice or judgment about an attitude or action. And when we're making those decisions, our decisions should be an act of, it, it, decisions are actually an act of our will, and they are always influenced by either the mind, something that's logical, or emotions, feelings. Now, I'm just as, just as sure as you're sitting here, I can almost guarantee that every one of us has made a decision based on pure speculation or feeling. And it's possible, is it not, that that decision actually works out well. Some people make a decision to take a pistol and to take the little six shooter or whatever and do the revolver and then click it. And it may work out well. But it's not a good decision. Many of us have escaped the tragic results of a bad decision because of the grace, mercy, and love of God. Because somehow, someway, in his all-knowingness, he knows that if you can get beyond that stupid, irrational, illogical, unbeneficial decision, if you can get past the results of it, that you'll make the best decision in your life and that's a decision to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior. So he'll somehow protect you from your own stupidity. I remember a time in the Bible in the book of Job, Satan goes to God and says, hey, I consider your servant. The only reason that he ever makes decisions based on you is because you protect him. And God says, okay, take and do what you want with Job, but you can't take his life. Did you ever consider why God put a parameter on that? Did you ever stop to think why God said you can't take his life? You see, think Satan thinks he knows it all, yet he's created. And therefore, it's impossible for him to know everything. And he thought that if God, for whatever reason, removed his blessings from Job, that Job would curse God, would make the decision to curse the one who had blessed him. But God knew different, didn't he? God knew different. God knew that if he had breath, Job would consider cursing God, but would choose not to curse God. Now many times we consider cursing God, do we not? Well, God, if you really loved me, well, then this would be different. If you really loved me, you wouldn't let this come on me. If you really loved me, why am I where I'm at? Been there, done that, right? Based basically purely on feelings and irrational thought. And that's probably what Job experienced. I mean, you know, this just didn't take a couple days. First of all, what Job was going through didn't take 20 minutes in three commercials, guarantee you that. Well, you come on down to Larry Miller Chariots and we'll give you a chariot that's good for 60 horses. Come on down. 
to Caesar's looking good and we'll give you the best meal of your life. Now, you see, it took some time. And I'm sure there was moments in which listening to Satan, Job said, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. God doesn't love me. But yet he chose in his mind to not curse God. And God knew that. And God knew that the results of this testing, so to speak, would turn out for his glory. And he could then bless Job. Amen? Even more so. And so even though intellectually we might want to say, no, I'm not going to do this, or I am going to do it, it comes down to what you really want, your will. It comes down to, and the will is always, like I said, influenced by either the logic or the feelings of the moment at hand. But I can honestly say that your decisions that you make for God, the, the fruit of that will be a blessing. Will be a blessing. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, the word of God in the Hebrew. Scriptures say this, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. Now, I can run with that. I don't know about you. I can run with that. That's a promise. I love promises. Listen to what the Word of God says. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. Now, decisions, decisions need to be based on God's revealed will. Now, let's just think about that statement. It's just so, it's not that brilliant, to be honest with you. Because how could you make a decision based on God's not revealed will? <laughs> How's that even possible? We have no clue who God is in himself, but yet because of the fact that he's chose to reveal himself, and we'll go back to Hebrews, and past times in various ways and through various means and through various people, but now in the latter days through his son Jesus Christ, and his son Jesus Christ said to me, if you've seen me in time and history, then you've seen my God who is outside of time and history. Now, if in fact God has revealed himself in time and history, then how can we make a decision according to his will? Because we have no clue what it is. And some theologians and philosophers and psychiatrists would argue that even though he has revealed himself, we still have no clue. Sounds like a pretty bad decision to me. Because the best way I can know God is to be able to entertain his son in my life where I reside and I can see what Jesus did and how he walked and how he talked and how he performed and the behavior of him who is a reflection of God outside of time and history. And from him who is my example, I can then take and make a decision to be like Jesus. Trust me, you don't want me to be like me. Because separate from God's love, mercy, and grace, I'm just like other individuals who have made bad decisions, who have made decisions to continue in their disobedience and continue to have the father of lies as their father and continue to make decisions that are unproductive and destructive and if spiritually speaking they don't make it right 
with God before they draw their last breath of air, they will get the desire of their heart, the decision that they made to be separated from his presence for all of eternity. And I don't care how you paint it, there's not enough words to express how devastating that experience will be. Just as my friend Jeremy, there's not enough words to express the blessings that will be bestowed upon us when we become like him. We can talk about it, but we can't fully comprehend it. The more intimately you draw close to the heart of God, the more clearly you will know the will of God. As you read God's written word, that written word will provide you with the tools that you need for life and a life of godliness. Look up 2 Peter, first chapter. So, we need to make decisions based on God's revealed will. Our decisions reveal the desires of our heart. In Psalms chapter 119, verse 30, the word of God says, choose the way of life. Choose the way of life. At the same time, it encourages us to set our hearts on his law. Choose the way of life by setting your hearts on his law. Your decisions are ultimately determined by what you desire the most. That movie, Dan, that you talk about where the guy is on Wall Street and the question is basically, I believe, is how much do you need to earn? How much do you need to earn? Is that pretty much framing it correctly? Yeah, he asked the question, what is your number? What is your number? What is your number? When it comes to power, possessions, and pleasures, and all the things that are created, what is your number? $18 an hour enough? $19 an hour enough? $25 an hour enough? I've never ever had a conversation with an individual who told me I'm making $19 an hour and that's enough. They've always told me, well, if I do A, B, C, and D, I'll be able to make more than $19 an hour. You see, in economics, we have qualitative and quantitative. The theory, qualitivity and quantitivity. You can't get enough, and then whenever you get whatever is not enough, it's not good enough. You buy a set of golf clubs, and you go around showing them, look at, I got a new set of golf clubs. It's a, a what? Taylor made. Taylor made. I don't know who Taylor is, but he made golf clubs. And maybe it's a she. <laughs> Taylor made. Look at my guy. <laughs> you know, you can take the very best driver and put it in my hands, and the ball won't get very far from that little thing that you stick in the ground. What's that called? A T. Why is it called a T? It doesn't even look like a T. Looks like a toothpick with a fat end. 
Got a big butt at the one end, point on the other. <laughs> you put that driver in my hand, three inches. Look at me. I'm almost off the tee box. You put that driver in Tiger Woods' hands, and he'll show you what Mr. Taylor can do. Amen. What you desire the most. And when your eyes are set on the things of this world, you never get to the most. You never get there. King Solomon said it without God, it ain't happening. Everything is futile. Now, some of you may say that King Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived on the earth. No, he wasn't. The truth is, Jesus is. All right? So, in this clip, in this movie clip, what is your number? Is that what it was? What is your number? More. More is my number. I'll be happy when I get more. So more is relative to wherever you are. And when do you get to where you want to be, that's where you are, and therefore more is relative to your new position in life. It's never, ever, ever enough, and it will never, ever, ever be satisfying. I want more. And I can go into every area of life, A through Z, and I can show you logically and rationally, with reason, that your desire to want more of the created never, ever, ever satisfies. So if you're going to choose more, then choose more of God. Amen. Joshua 24, chapter 15 says, If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And who's my household? It's those who choose to live underneath my auspices as a patriarch of the family. So when you're in my house, you live by my rules. And my rules are biblical and godly. And the benefits that you receive surely by living in my house are biblical as well. But if for whatever reason you think that that seems undesirable to you, then you need to leave and live in your house. It's as simple as that. I want to live in God's house. Amen. And God made it possible for us to do just that. So years ago, Jesus was born of a Virgin Mary and laid in swaddling clothes in a manger. He came as a child. Next time he comes, he'll come as a king. And the Easter, the Easter historical event, I don't want to call it story, the Easter story, 
What is the Easter story? What is the Christmas story? No. Because it's so easy to confuse fiction and nonfiction. Just as sure as I'm standing here. The Easter historical events of the life of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection could not have taken place had it not been for the historical event that happened in Bethlehem that night some 2,000 years ago when the, in, when the word became incarnate in man, man and first arrived in time in history the personification of it in a little baby named Jesus. Without the Christmas historical event, the Easter historical event could never happen. All right? But between the two, you have this. And we'll close this morning with this, because this is what today is all about. God, to love the world, me. And he gave me the best gift that I could ever get. His one and only begotten son, Jesus. That in my free will, the will to choose to either accept him or reject him, the promise, the blessed promise, Brother Jeremy, of the fact that if I accept Jesus, I'll not perish, that is, experience spiritual death. Removal from the presence of God for all of eternity. But share. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Share in everlasting life. In the presence of God, the Creator. Make that decision if you haven't. Don't be just a doer of the word, or excuse me, a spewer of the word, but be a doer of the word. You say, Satan can spew the word of God better than any one of us. but he can't even touch me when it comes to being a doer of the word of God. So Satan, get over it. Amen. Amen. Greater is he that lives in me than he that lives in the world. God bless you. Let us stand. Your decisions are ultimately determined by what you desire the most. Want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. Hallelujah. I want more, Jesus. So I'll give him more of me. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the words spoken through me this morning. Certainly they're your words and not mine. And Father, let us take them to heart and let us purpose in our heart to be obedient to the law that you've given us, to the revelation that you've given us, to not only the written word, but to the personification of the written word throughout time and history as well as before time and history, your son, Christ Jesus. 
Today, let us remember the season for the, or the reason for the season is Jesus and that we can rise above that which is around us to be able to bring him praise, honor, and glory in whatever we think, whatever we do, wherever we go, with ever whom we come into contact with. Let us always bring God praise, honor, and glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Please let us know how we can pray for you and your loved ones. You can submit your prayer request at itswritten.org as well as find additional teachings in truth. If you would like to join us in person, we meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. For more information, our address and phone number are on our website, itswritten.org. Thanks and God bless you.